and welcome everyone to the Future of Mobility Innovation in America. I'm Hayes Ferguson, Director of the Farley Center, and I'm thrilled to introduce our moderator and panelists. Our four panelists come from a variety of backgrounds and places, but they are united in their focus on fostering innovation in the way that we move. Our moderator is Vijay Vathaswaran, Farley's Distinguished Visiting Fellow. Vijay is an editor at The Economist, where he's used his background as an MIT-trained engineer to write on a wide range of topics over the past three decades, including innovation. He also chairs The Economist's Innovation Summit. Welcome, Vijay. Uh, I'd like to introduce our, our panelists next, uh, and appropriately, we'll start with uh, Robin Chase and a little bit of uh, pre-panel conversation. It turns out a lot of the folks that she brought together uh, at Zipcar uh, went on to work with some of the other panelists, so that's a fun connection. Robin Chase co-founded and is the former CEO of Zipcar, the world's leading car sharing network. She's also co-founder of Vinium, a network company that moves data between vehicles and the cloud, and she's recently co-founded nonprofit at NUMO, which channels urban mobility technologies to build cities that are sustainable and just. Welcome, Robin. Lovely to be here. Sean Carolyn is an early stage investor who backs companies that provide better, faster, and cheaper ways to move through life. This approach inspired him to invest early in Uber and Roku long before they became household names. He is a partner at Menlo Ventures and investment lead at Uber. Welcome, Sean. John McNeil may be uh, 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 familiar to, to, to some of you. He is a Northwestern alum, former COO of Lyft, former president at Tesla. He is currently the CEO and co-founder of DVX Ventures, a company that is on a mission to create great companies. John has founded and scaled six companies and serves on several boards, including Lululemon and CrossFit. Welcome, John. Thank you. Nice to be here. And last but not least, uh, another Northwestern alum, Casey Lundquist Ryder. Casey is head of vehicle operations at Bird Rides, the company focused on scooter sharing. Casey began her career in finance and made the switch to startup operations after graduating from Kellogg. She has worked at several startups with her last two companies, sending her to work in Amsterdam for almost five years. Welcome, Casey. Thanks, happy to be here as well. An honor to be here with such an amazing group of people. Before I turn, well, we're, we're delighted to have all of you here. And before I turn the mic over to VJ, I want to encourage all of you in the audience to submit questions in the Q&A section of your screen. Uh, we'll start answering those questions around uh, 1.45 p.m. Central Time. Is that, I think, uh, I think I'm on the right time zone. It's my pleasure now to turn over the mic to VJ, who will begin today's conversation. Take it away, VJ. Thank you. Hayes, thank you. It's... Uh... My great pleasure uh, and honor to be here today to be our immoderate moderator as we uh, appear into the future of mobility innovation in America uh, and to have such a fantastic, a real crackerjack panel of doers, not just thinkers, but doers. Um, this is a, a tough problem, uh, innovation in transportation um, and energy. These are two of the biggest industries in the world and they are slow moving and only occasionally do you find tipping points. Let's remember uh, two centuries ago, America faced an energy crisis. And at that time, it's not necessarily the one you might be thinking of, it was we were uh, running out of whale blubber. The whalers in my native New England had managed to kill off most of the world's whales, uh, very sadly. And uh, that led in an indirect way to uh, the first great oil boom, a petroleum boom in uh, Pennsylvania that was primarily used for lighting. But we didn't see the second half of that symbiotic twin uh, that powered the 20th, 20th century of, of transport. For decades, the internal combustion engine was bubbling along from Europe. And it's really even 50 years after that oil boom, we could have a competition on the streets of New York between electric vehicles and uh, gasoline powered vehicles in which the performance of the automobile powered by the internal combustion engine was so poor that people on the sidelines were heard shouting, get a horse, get a horse. But it was an environmental problem of that age that led to that transition. And that was horse manure, piles and piles of horse manure on the streets of Chicago, New York, San Francisco, and the other great cities. And of course, all of the, again, very sad, story but dead horses from uh, being whipped into, into submission, uh, that led to an impetus that we saw a convergence of forces. 
environmental uh, energy, and in this case, uh, uh, business models emerged as well, a symbiosis of technologies. So the question today, we look at the landscape and we see um, twin crises again. We see energy with its geopolitical crises and challenges, and we see the environmental challenge, uh, the existential environmental challenge of climate change uh, coming to the fore. Uh, what is the prospect now that we might be approaching a tipping point where this century long symbiotic twin, the internal combustion engine and gasoline, the automotive uh, uh, powerhouse as we've known it, uh, that may be displaced, augmented and ultimately displaced by a, a range of new kinds of mobility options. And that's exactly what our innovators on our panel are working on, have been thinking about and helped uh, bring that sort of transition uh, to the fore. We wanna ask what are the new innovations? What are the new business models? What policies may be required or already are coming uh, to give a push? And what about consumers? What about all of us? What role do we play in all of this? So that's what we wanna explore and with a sense of, of uh, possibilities that I think our uh, panelists uh, bring to the table. I wanna start um, by getting an assessment uh, of how uh, each of my panelists, uh, starting with Robin, uh, who led the way for, uh, for all of us on this topic here, um, give us a sense of how you uh, see the state of uh, mobility innovation in light of the pandemic. Now there's been a great reset in many industries and in many aspects, uh, a sense of possibilities opening up. Do you see the pandemic uh, and coming out of the pandemic as an opportunity, uh, or do you see that some of the forces of legacy are, have also gotten stronger, that it might be harder? Um, uh, public transit systems are bankrupt in New York and other cities, for example. You know, it, it's not entirely a clear picture to some what will come out of this. So let me, maybe let's start with you, Robin, with a, a warm welcome for, for joining us. As I said, it's great to be here. I'm laughing as you ask this question because I think a narrative is so important. How, what kind of story are we gonna tell? And so I could tell a positive story that the pandemic has encouraged many cities, small and large, to rethink street space allocation and to think about people instead of cars as the, pri as, as the focus of interest. And so what do we wanna do on our streets? Do we wanna make people happy or do we wanna make move cars? And so that's, that's been an amazing opportunity. And I look at that as great. And I was just thinking back, I've actually been on three panels this week, but if we think back to the beginning of the pandemic, do you remember on Twitter and elsewhere how there was this ooing and eyeing over the clean skies and what people could see? And I'm laughing that that joy and amazement, which we were all thinking, yes, people are finally realized that it matters. I feel like that just split in a second. Um, so in any case, I think we have an, we have the ability now to rethink street space allocation. And I think that's really important if we wanna have any innovation that doesn't just include cars. So cars right now are consuming up all the street space and making what I'm extremely excited about um, electric micromobility, it's really crowding that out. And so there is something of a street fight going on right now. Um, to your piece about the, what the pandemic showed for me, the takeaway I want to take away from the pandemic and is transit, people wouldn't take it and, and people are people all buying cars, cars. I want to say, we don't know what the next um, drama is going to be, but what I do know is that this should have pointed out that we need resilience. We really, really need to have multiple options for individuals that it can't be, you can only get someplace by transit and it can't be, you can only get someplace by car that we really, each of us have to have this multiplicity of, of options. And that's where I see an enormous amount of potential. And as I say, when we combine that with being able to restructure the public way. Great, so I, I'm hearing uh, some optimism, as you say, depends on what storyline we wanna put attached to it, but also maybe some concern of possible snapback that we may just bounce back after having been in a, a bit of a, a la la land um, a nirvana of sorts, um, uh, a dystopian in some ways, obviously it was a horrible time uh, in let many just, ways, but a utopian in sentence. other ways. Let yeah, me just add please. one sentence, which is the thing about transportation, which makes it so engaging is that it is hyper local. And so it is city by city. Are we talking about New York city? Or are we talking about Cincinnati? Are we talking about Paris? Like each and every one has a different geography, different density, different transit backbone or not different possibility, different rules. And so to make pronouncements that are global is always impossible. 
Um, that's a, ver a fair point. Uh, although, I mean, we can say globally the car won in the 20th century. That part of it, I think, is re history shows it was possible. And there is a very powerful incumbent globally, generally speaking, with streets and cities built out for the car and uh, regulations generally in favor. So uh, at least we know if for those who want to argue for a variety of choices in mobility innovation, there is an incumbent that has a set of uh, a common uh, advantages. But to your point, um, uh, er the barricades on every city street will be different and the policies and we've seen the responses to Uber and Lyft in different parts of the world. Uh, policy response has been different, for example, that determines or hinders their success. So uh, your point well taken, but let's go to the streets. Uh, Casey, you are in the trenches. I mean, if we're talking about a street battle, uh, you, you're, you're, you and your products and your customers are there. Uh, tell us uh, what's your view from the front lines um, what has been uh, the experience of your company, uh, your product uh, getting out there, as well as some of the uh, possibilities and challenges coming out of the pandemic? Yeah, um, I'd say we aren't out of the pandemic yet, and it's it's not entirely black and white. So I was living in Europe when the pandemic hit, and my scope was in Europe at that point in time. Um, and it really wasn't black and white there. Multiple countries kind of reacted to the pandemic differently, um, in particular how they treated scooter shared scooter companies. Um, so while some companies actually had uh, micro mobility companies actually completely shut down, there were other cities, many of which actually who had previously said absolutely no to scooters who actually turned around, um, called us and said, please actually, could you could you launch your scooters here? Um, because it offers a socially distanced and less crowded form of getting to work and getting around, et cetera. Um, so as Robin mentioned, um, it also kind of as a result, accelerated the speed at which cities were rethinking their infrastructure and how to share roads with other micromobility options. So take the UK, for example, they actually accelerated their plans to have scooter trials and increase the number of trials as a result of the pandemic. So, um, you know, in the glass half full, I think, um, you know, there are a lot of ways that cities have started rethinking, you know, the ways they want to share their roads um, more quickly than they would have as a result of the pandemic. There's other cities, Paris, Madrid, um, Barcelona, a lot of other cities are really starting to accelerate the way that they want to um, share their roads. They're dedicating certain days of the week to the core urban center where no um, gas powered vehicles are allowed and things like that. So I think there were definitely some upsides and some downsides, um, you know, you know, of course, there were devastating effects on profitability for a lot of these shared micromobility companies and, you know, hurt um, the gig workers who were working in those particular um, particular companies and industries. But I do think it was really a pivotal moment for accelerating the spread of the use of electric scooters and other micromobility options, which will um, only benefit uh, us as we move forward. It sounds like um, your astute observation about this not being the end of the pandemic um being spot on, you broadly think that um, there will be permanent and generally helpful effects coming out of this period of time for your industry. Is that right? I do. Okay. Well, that, that's good to hear. And I, I do want to dwell on that note of caution you gave, Casey. You're quite right. Uh, here in the United States, and we're focused on mobility in America with this session, but of course, our audience um, is global, people connecting from all over the place, and we're mindful of global trends. You have global companies on the panel. Uh, the pandemic is far from over in places like India and Brazil is getting worse and not better. And, and more broadly, uh, I think we do need to be, and I speak as a, a former health editor for The Economist, and I covered the last pandemic a decade ago, and it became very clear at that time uh, that we are entering an age of pandemics, that uh, this is something that we need to be ready for. And we haven't thought through sufficiently as a society that there will be waves, uh, not only of this particular virus, but possibly others. And so we need to have much greater vigilance, resilience, uh, and a capacity to cope um, uh, around the world. And so I, I hope we'll uh, accelerate investments in that area. And in that context of re reimagining uh, the public space, the role of government uh, and, the, and where transport fits in that, when hopefully we'll, we'll see some sort of uh, uh, options for mobility innovation coming through that as well. Um, let me turn to uh, John next. Uh, John, uh, how do you see this question of um, uh, opportunity versus perhaps continued challenges coming out of this period for uh, mobility innovation. Yeah, I think pa the pandemic probably, uh, the headlines for me are maybe one negative and one positive. Uh, the negative is that uh, car sales went through the roof uh, as people considered an individual car again, their own PPE. Uh, and uh, people got scared of being in in dense transit uh, and, uh, and, and people bought a record number of cars. 
And I think that is a potential uh, step backward, not a permanent step backward, but given ownership periods, it could be a multi-year step backward. Um, and that's uh, that I think is uh, is something for policymakers really to think about. Um, uh, the good news is a record portion of those cars were electric uh, around the world, but um, there's much more work to do there. I think the positive is uh, just as uh, as both Robin and Casey have uh, have mentioned, when the city's emptied out, uh, city planners started to realize they have an incredibly valuable asset, and that's curb space and street space. And uh, as the as the cities were empty, it gave them a freedom to take paint on that canvas, and um, it is, uh, I think, uh, really interesting to see if these changes will be permanent. But uh, here in the San Francisco area, uh, the the streets have been taken over by restaurants uh, and uh, and increased bike share parking uh, and uh, and stations uh, and scooter share. Uh, and we've watched this internationally too on the on the board of a uh, of uh, a company also in the scooter space here in Europe. Uh, and uh, there's been an explosion of uh, tenders and uh, increased space on city curbs uh, that uh, largely will be permanent. Uh, and I think that's fantastic, along with some new bike lanes that were created given lack of uh, lack of traffic. So I, I think there's a positive and negatives to the pandemic and, uh, and I agree with Casey around the caution. We're not out of the woods yet. Europe certainly isn't out of the woods yet and uh, areas of Asia and Latin America certainly and uh, are still struggling. Great. Well, well, well observed, and, and of course, the uh, record number of bikes bought, not only cars, um, uh, during this pandemic. So it's worth uh, noting that. Uh, Sean, uh, to you, what? How do you see things? Um, obviously, you're uh, an investor. You were early in on Uber. You saw a trend, a change coming. Uh, what's it been like uh, from the investment perspective? Uh, has it been a rough pandemic, or do you see opportunity coming out of this for investors in mobility? Uh, I'd say both. It was an extremely rough pandemic. I mean, you, you look at the, you know, the Ubers who fortunately in, had kind of diversified, you know, obviously the ride sharing got slammed, but the, you know, Uber Eats slash getting food at home, you know, right. accelerated, right? So I think it was a rough, I mean, generally speaking for transportation companies, it was an exceptionally rough pandemic. Uh, I'm going to, I guess, be kind of the the panel bull as the investor here of always looking for the bright side of, of what can come out of these things. I mean, I think generally speaking, innovate, innovation benefits when there's disruption. And this was an incredible disruption for society, right? I mean, so many of us look at this panel, right? Like, would I have been, if this was on the Northwestern campus, would I be there? You know, probably not, but we get to be together, you know, virtually. So I think the amount that people move is far less right? Uh, we've done surveys of our portfolio and, and, you know, some companies have gone fully virtual. We're probably going back, you know, two days a week. So just moving less takes a lot of load off the transportation system. I think, you know, uh, John mentioned people are moving alone. So that goes the other direction. So there's a lot of things that are sort of netting out. So that's one. Two is the innovation and what I think of as virtual movement. Uh, I don't know if people have seen the, the project Starline, Google project, but that's been something that's kind of a uh, teleportation like service, you know, you're looking at a screen and it feels like you're looking through a window at somebody else. And so there's been this immense, you know, we have a company called TeamFlow, which is kind of like hanging out in the virtual office together and you can kind of pull yourself over to a room and talk to each other and then pull yourself back to your desk and, and not talk. So because we are all forced to be at home for a year, I mean, many entrepreneurs in the world, you know, are innovating across social and the way we interact at work and all of these ways in which we're not, again, stressing the transportation system, mm -hmm. but still able to kind of be together. And then I guess the last piece, which seems like a bull, but I think is a good thing. I'm, I'm a fairly conservative investor. I like to see, uh, you know, profits and, and not, you know, money bleeding. And I think, especially in micromobility, uh, have just seen, you know, a lot of these companies which felt like, oh, my God, you know, we got to be all over the world tomorrow. And let's face it, you know, we, 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 you know, invested in some of these and the unit economics were not there. You know, people were putting these assets on the street that cost, you know, $500 and they would disappear, get chopped up for their batteries, show, show up in the bay, you know, a week or two later, like that CapEx did not recover from the amount of utilization it got. And so I think it's kind of a good thing 
that everybody's slowing down a little bit from a safety perspective, you know, making sure the riders have kind of like safety measures from a you know, city planning. Okay, let's get protected lanes where there's parking and then there's a bike lane. So, you know, cars aren't running into, into people from a just deployment of capital. You're not wasting as much money trying to, you know, win or take all, claim all these cities and just doing a little bit more slow, thoughtful approach for transportation, which I think um, it's one of these markets where generally it's not, you know, let's, you know, fail fast, move fast and break things. It's like, no, let's be thoughtful planners and, and get things right. So I think that's kind of been a good thing for the the industry and you know still all of the promises that existed a year ago are there great um you get a real sense of the dynamism uh coming out of this and you know as ever uh, uh recessions crises often create opportunities as well for reorganization of intellectual and financial capital so i think there's this real opportunity um i want to um uh, turn now to the future of the automobile, and then we'll go beyond the automobile next. Uh, I just want to give it its due, right? It has been a, a much more durable than people thought. Um, uh, you know, the death of the motor car has been forecast by environmentalists and others, urban uh, advocates for a long, long time. Uh, and as has been noted in this um, panel, uh, more people rushed out to buy more cars when they moved to the suburbs to get away from the cities and so on. So uh, the dinosaur can learn how to dance as well, right? So um, with that in mind, uh, I wanna uh, go around again to our panelists and uh, I'll go in the same order unless someone feels motivated to jump in and challenge someone else, please just give an indication that you'd like to do that, we'll come to you. Let's make it more free flowing. Uh, take a 10 year time frame. the next 10 years, which are the big trends that you think uh, will really dominate? And try to pick one. Uh, we've talked uh, a little bit about electric electrification. It's been mentioned, of course, Tesla. Um, uh, John, you have uh, some close knowledge of that, but uh, massive trend, uh, Ford Motor Company, uh, GM have uh, come, come on board with this Volkswagen in a big way. Uh, of course, ride sharing and sh the sharing of assets more broadly uh, is something that, that we have a, a Sean early pioneer with the Uber investments, but uh, Lyft as well. Of course, with John, so we have a lot of knowledge on, in this space about sharing of assets. We've seen consumers voting with their feet, especially younger consumers. Uh, I think it's about five, four years ago, we put on our cover um, peak car, that is uh, younger people choosing not to buy cars uh, for uh, multiple reasons, social, economic, uh, et cetera. Uh, and, and so can, can you give me a sense, and there may be other things, maybe somebody wants to make the case that the motor car will still be here 10 years from now or 20 years from now. Uh, I wanna give a chance to get a sense of how dynamic or how vulnerable is the incumbent to get a sense of what's the opening for the challengers. Um, uh, who'd like to kick us off? Well, somebody want to jump in with a, uh, a put a bold stake in the ground? Robin, uh, you led the way 20 years ago, lead us again. I think everything is contingent right now on, we're talking about the US, whether yeah. this government who has, has made a pledge that all of its policies are supposed to be addressing climate change and, and inequality if we are supposed to reduce emissions 50% in the next 10 years, there, I, I don't believe there's any way we can do that following a, the pattern of the car as the premier de facto, when I step out my door, way that I travel. That um, there's this really interesting thing that the OECD um, put out in the last six months that was the life cycle, CO2 emissions life cycle of all these different modes. So shared cars, personal cars, shared bikes, personal, shared personal bikes, transit, all the different ways. And it was clear that even an electric car, because of its manufacturing and what's required to build highways and its maintenance and whatever, it will, it will never be able to compete in, in terms of CO2 emissions if we're concerned about um, CO2 emissions. So it just, it will never, it will never make sense for me as an individual, my 120 pound self to be driving around in two tons of metal. Never, it will never, no matter what's happening, it's never, doesn't make sense. So what I'd like to see happen over the next 10 years is that we really do adopt this. I want, I really do believe that from birth till grave, there is no one mode that's the right mode. So we really honestly, positively for income reasons, sex reasons, families, lifestyle, rural, urban, we have to have multiple modes. Um, so, and cars will be part of that, but I think cars to be part of that, we need to get out of the single occupancy vehicle, car vehicle, 
as 70% mm. of our trips, that has to be something that if I had to ban one thing, that's what I would ban. And so it does mean more um, shared travel. And I even want to say, I want to say I would ban personal car ownership, single occupancy trips, because taking an Uber or a Lyft or a taxi, which is exactly what it is, I have to pay the full cost. So I make an I, I decide, do I really want to pay six bucks or 12 bucks to do this trip by car or do I want to do something else? And in your own car, you never, ever, ever once make that financial calculation. So in any case, if we're going to survive this and um, have emissions reduced by 50% in, in 10 years, by 2030, the car, the personal car really needs to take a backseat to a panoply of other options. And um, I, as I say, I think there's plenty of shared cars, shared transportation um, with motors that I think are, are great. And I really do love the idea of micromobility, electric micromobility. That's great. Um, I, I see, I see Casey, Casey motioning, I'm going to come to you in a moment. But I, I just, I would be remiss as the man from The Economist if I didn't applaud you, Robin, for bringing out uh, externalities and the value of uh, transparent pricing, the true, true cost of uh, driving a car by yourself. Uh, and so uh, definitely certainly endorse that point of view. Um, and let's let's see how far down that road we can get. Casey, what do you think? I agree um, wholeheartedly with all the things that Robin just said. I'd add that, um, you know, in addition to the major point point of, of gas powered cars um, emitting horrible things into the planet that is causing climate, uh, that affects our climate, it affects our health. Um, but separate from that problem is also just congestion and the fact that we're simply running out of space, particularly in those major cities. So what a lot of people don't realize is 60% of our vehicle trips are less than five miles long. So that means half the time, over half the time people are getting into their car, it's to go get that gallon of milk or roll of toilet paper they forgot at the store. Um, and we just don't need a giant vehicle to, to do those types of trips. Um, and so we really need to embrace smaller alternatives to the car, especially in cities um, that are more dense and that allow for that. Um, I'm cognizant that not, not all infrastructure supports this. If you live in large, large suburban areas, the car will generally be the main mode of transportation and will be hard to, harder to transform in, in the near future. Um, but, um, you know, we need to, um, consider the fact that you can you can fit 20 scooters in the same space as one car. So in addition to the climate, um, the the pure fact that our, we're growing as a population and our cities don't have enough space to fit um, all of these giant medical metal vehicles, um, you know, hopefully does move us into the micro mobility space a little bit faster. So um, as a result, I'd see the trend away from single use cars will definitely persevere in the near future, um, similar to what Robin was saying. Now, John uh, and Sean, both of you have made investments uh, involving the metal that's being bashed by our previous speakers. Uh, do either of you want to uh, offer a different point of view about the prospects for the automobile, whatever powers it? I, I think you know, I, I would largely agree with what's been said. The um, it, financial physics usually wins. Uh, and when you have the second largest household asset for those that own a car that's utilized less than 5% a day and depreciates roughly 15 to 20% a year, uh, that's not good financial physics. That will change. And that's what's driving, I think, people to think about uh, first sharing and then different modes. And as Casey just said, it doesn't make sense in a lot of dense urban environments uh, for the trips that are less than five miles to be in a car. Uh, there are other modes, uh, e-bikes, uh, scooters are two, public transit is a third, um, all super viable. And so I think there is a, there's an inevitable rethinking of the, uh, of the personal car for a number of trips and, uh, and how it's owned and, and then potentially how it's utilized and shared. Um, I had an old uh, MIT manufacturing professor that drove into my head this uh, principle that never let best be the, uh, the greater enemy of the good. Uh, and uh, there is a step change uh, in CO2 emissions from uh, combustion to electric. Uh, and there's other externalities in cities, especially that, uh, that are important. Uh, if, if you happen to live within a kilometer of a highway or a freeway, uh, your chances of dying of lung cancer are 66% higher than if you don't. And that's almost all from emissions and largely diesel emissions. And it turns out uh, the people that live within a kilometer of a freeway uh, are typically poor. Uh, they can't afford to live away from that freeway. 
Uh, and so there's an equality issue and an externality that comes along with all these uh, all these personal vehicles and the miles that are being traveled. And and one, uh, I think, critical transportation issue that uh, is driving tra congestion and traffic up is delivery. Uh, and that is an invisible, uh, largely invisible source today that, uh, that I think needs to be um, needs to be accounted for as well. So, John, you're, you're absolutely right to emphasize the environmental justice component. In addition to the point you made, uh, you know, I live in New York City and uh, overwhelming majority of bus depots for the uh, Metro Bus Authority and diesel refueling stations are in Harlem, uh, yeah. the poorest part of Manhattan, right? Um, and so we see this pattern repeated around the country uh, of environmental injustice related to traditional fossil emissions. And so that there's a powerful angle there. I wanted to add one more point. You, you talked about uh, the, the financial physics uh, being inexorable. Uh, with the automobile, uh, there's also a thermodynamics. Um, and if we look at... Um, an observation that Amory Lovins, a great energy guru at the Rocky Mountain Institute has made for several decades now. On his calculation, less than 1% of the energy content of a tank of gasoline is used to move the driver in a forward direction. All of the rest of it is either on inefficiency, waste, axle, uh, <laughs> transmitting power within the car or moving the hunk of metal. So we can surely do better after a hundred plus years. And I think that's what we're working on. Sean, a quick word from you on uh, the prospects for the automobile in any form in the next 10 years before we pivot to what else is there beyond yeah. the automobile? Yeah, I, I answer it in a slightly different way is, um, you know, consumer behavior is very nuanced. And, and you know, John used financial physics as a hat tip to the economists. I, I think of it the invisible hand, but you like governments cannot tell consumers what to do. They can make things, you know, easier or cheaper for consumers and then let them make a different decision. So I think you really have to look at, at transportation as you know, what is the job to be done? And even if my grocery store is a mile away, if I am you know have even a gallon of milk, I can't ride that back on a scooter. I mean, I love scooters. I have a lot of fun riding them. If I'm going to dinner with my you know, friends, I'll take a scooter over and, and, and park it. But if I have to get a gallon of milk, you know, and, you got to either throw a big backpack on. So, so I think you got to be as a government or somebody who's trying to influence these decisions, be like super careful where are people spending their time and money. And they're always going to make the decision of like, Hey, what's cheaper for me? What's easier for me to get the job done. So, you know, micro mobility, if it, I'm in Seattle and it rains 200 days a year, like it's just a lot of people aren't going to ride scooters in the rain. That said, like, you know, oftentimes you're going out to get goods and if the goods came to you, then that would be easier, right? So I think if, if you think of, you know, electrification of transportation trucks or different consumer services where, hey, you know, food can come to every house at a block, you know, return the milkman or something like that. I mean, we're, we're looking at next gen grocery delivery, which we saw really accelerate through the pandemic, have, have some investments there. So just, you know, thinking about ways to change it so that, yeah, you don't need the car as much as you need the car less because it's such a big, big expenditure. People are going to be looking for alternatives to, you know, spending money on those, you know, leases or, or purchases. Great. Okay. So that's, that's it. That's a good point. Um, uh, it's a good point to pivot as well, as I've been um, referencing, I want to uh, talk about the options that are proliferating uh, and, and that are uh, possibilities to think about alongside the automobile for the moment, but Maybe, maybe displacing in future, uh, uh, maybe even the near future. Um, uh, Casey, we heard from you obviously about uh, scooters uh, in New York City. We've had uh, uh, the big scooters, the Rebels, uh, the Vespa type of scooters for those who are not following this. Um, uh, who wants to put on the table uh, an idea of what non-automobile form of micro mobility or innovative mobility you think has the most promise in the next five to 10 years? Bikes. Tell us, tell us more. Um, I've been challenging people who haven't tried an electric bike to go try one. And I think once you try it, if your city has the infrastructure, if you can feel safe on it, you think to yourself, why would I ever go any other way? Even in the rain, you feel this incredible independence and autonomy. You're nimble. You can park anywhere. It, it is honestly like the dream vehicle. And I've been, people talk a lot about, oh, do you remember when you got your first car? I want to remind you, do you remember when you first learned how to ride a bike and the joy um, that you felt? And it's just so light and fast and zippy. And, and um, Sean, I'm laughing. One of the investors that refused to invest in Zipcar had said to me, 
I'll never invest in zip cars. The first time I find a potato chip bag in that car, I'm never doing it again. <laughs> and when you talked about the gallon of milk, I carry things way heavier by foot on my, on my back and on my bike and on a scooter. Like, just have a child. Like, you're carrying stuff all the time. <laughs> So um, I, I don't think, or rain in Copenhagen, people in, and in the Netherlands, it's terrible weather um, and people are using them. It's, it, it is, and just one last piece on Riff that I really am with you that people choose the easy and convenient thing. And we have spent the last hundred years making cars the easy and convenient thing. We are subsidizing them 25 ways. And if we took away the subsidies, we would not. It was costing me a nine times the price that it cost me to, to do other things, which is what it does cost me, I wouldn't be taking that car except for when I needed a car, when I had like, the other options. So in any case, um, I think government policy has a lot to do with um, what our choices are. And I'm down with you. Economics and convenience drives everything. I mean, to your point, Robin, now we have seen, obviously, particularly in Europe, um, uh, and to a lesser extent here, uh, some attempts to price or uh, use regulation in city centers, particularly uh, congestion charging or this different euphemisms uh, that are used to increase the cost of motoring or to restrict cars to try to encourage the alternatives. And uh, we have seen early success from that in Europe. Uh, we haven't seen a widespread expansion in the US. Uh, let's, let's see what happens. Um, uh, Casey, do you want to put in a, a word? Give us a, a perspective on uh, e-bikes, you know, you now have a, a contender in the micro mobility for your uh, alternative. Uh, how do you see as the trade-offs? How, how much of it is a head-to-head -head versus complementary? Give us a sense of how you see that competition. Yeah, I don't think it's a, a one shoe fits all situation. Um, I think different cities that have different infrastructure and different weather patterns are, you know, reasons to have different vehicles. A scooter, you know, as Sean said, it's not going to be the best thing if you need to go get a bunch of groceries. Arguably, you can put um, a gallon of milk in a backpack, um, but perhaps something like a cargo bike might be something more interesting. Um, you know, IKEA, I don't remember where they're piloting this, but IKEA has somewhere in Europe um, piloted a program where they're actually renting out cargo bikes for you to take all of your stuff from IKEA. And so if you think about IKEA, that's like where you go get your huge boxes if, you know, they're starting to you know, see some progress with the program where you can actually use a bike to take all of your goods home from Ikea, you know, there's a whole host of opportunity there. Um, Do they have a, a tandem version so the guy who's going to set it up for me can come home, come, come with me? Maybe. It's <laughs> a good point. Good question. It's electric. You won't need the guy helping you. There yeah. you go. There you go. Um, <laughs> I own an electric bike. I, I lived in Amsterdam, so I, I own a normal bike. I also own an electric bike um, that's called an Urban Arrow that has a huge bucket seat. And it's basically the minivan of Europe. Um, and it is what people use to get around, um, to buy our groceries, to drop our kids off at school. Um, it's because it is how the city has been built. Um, yes, there's a lot of rain. And so people, I think, are a little bit more resilient to that. It's not necessarily what I love doing. Um, and if you look at Israel, for example, you know they have great weather. It's relatively a dense city. And so scooters are totally fine. You don't need, um, you know, a fast electric bike. It's a flat city. Um, and so other options, non-electric options, uh, like a normal bike also works well there. Um, so I'd say, you know, like every different cities will mandate different options. I hope in the future we can come up with different types of uh, different modes of transportation, you know, like, a you know, in, envision something like a some type of covered e-bike. Um, so when it is raining or when it is cold, you can still use that, um, you know, miniature cars of some way, electric cars that are at least a, a lot smaller than the existing car. I think there's, there's so much room and opportunity to be had of, of more experimentation in this, in this space. I'm excited to kind of see how we evolve as a society in the coming years. Um, thank you. Uh, you know, Sean, uh, your comment about the milk um, made me think about uh, interview I did a few years ago with the company that bought Segway, um, uh, the Chinese company. Uh, and at that time, uh, they had in mind uh, basically a Segway knockoff uh, at a, a one-tenth the price. That would be a follow me device. So it would uh, come with you to the, uh, you could ride it to the grocery yeah. store, but then it would have all your groceries and it would it would follow you home with your, with your uh, luggage. I don't know if they ever launched it. I didn't keep up with that. But the idea that, that there's interesting innovations uh, in, in this kind of uh, urban need, uh, I think is certainly there. Do you see any uh, traction for uh, any of these micro mobility or alternative mobility uh, areas, more, one more than the other, that would be attractive? 
it's interesting. We were talking about the bikes and, and, you know, after Uber, we had kind of were looking at both scooters versus e-bikes and, and we ended up investing in jump early on. And I think at that time, uh, bird had just launched in kind of the LA area and, you know, the logic dictated like, Oh, well, everybody knows how to ride a bike. We did a bake off uh, internally of like, okay, you know, my colleague Kroom, you go take an Uber. I'm going to ride a jump bike. You know, somebody else is going to walk. And I like smoked everybody on the, the jump e-bike and yeah, you know, wind was in my hair and it was delightful. You have the cargo argument. Hey, there's a basket in front. I can put some. So all of the arguments were in favor of the e-bike and then scooters ended up taking off way faster. So this is where, again, kind of like consumer behavior is very nuanced. I'm not going to go into all the reasons why in hindsight we felt like that happened, but you just have to be you know, careful in, in overanalyzing and to some extent, just put these things in people's hands and, and see what happens. Um, you know, you said five to 10 years. So I'm just going to put a plug in for the EV tolls of the world, the electric vertical takeoff and landing devices. I mean, I, I like to think of them as drones for humans. You think of like, you know, the way drones took off at some point, they're going to be, you know, very safe, all electric. And, you know, the airspace is, is free and unoccupied. You could move very quickly, like with full autonomy. So I don't know. Uh, I think, you know, some of these Joby and, and whatnot are, are saying they're going to be launching, I don't know, 2023, 2024. So it's not super far off, but I think within 10 years, the fact that, you know, something could theoretically just zip up, you know, there's other things to like bring the noise profile down of them. So they're not, you know, in your ears, they move over, but, you know, delivery and movement of, of people and goods, you know, using airborne electric vehicles i think that's going to be i don't know a trillion dollar market at some point you know it'll, it's going to take a lot a while and again this is one faa and there's all of these things that have to happen before they're realistic but you know from what i've been told right. the uh the the cost profile of electric airborne movement versus gas is like a tenth right so you can think of you know moving from here to sf for, you know, right. sub $50. And, and that would be, you know, it would, a lot of people would make a difference. Well, I, I asked for bold awesome. ideas, Sean, you haven't let me down. So that's, that's good. Uh, and John, let me give you a last crack at uh, your prediction. And then in the next 10 years, just micro mobility, alternative mobility to the car. What do you think is going to take off more? Uh, I, well, I think it's equal. And I think it's multiple. Uh, I think uh, for journeys under a mile or two, it's a scooter uh, between uh, two and five miles is probably an e-bike. Uh, and uh, five to 10 miles, it is some form of uh, hopefully dense autonomous uh, and electric uh, transport. And then beyond that, as people escape cities, I think that's, uh, you know, for weekends and other things, there's, uh, that's where the need for the personal vehicle comes in um, because it's hard to get density in some of those routes. So I think it's a multiplicity of, uh, of modes uh, and uh, hopefully as much of that is shared as possible. Great. Um, okay, so we've got your uh, uh, provocations on the table. I appreciate that. Now, uh, this is the time we take uh, questions from the floor. So I encourage uh, the audience to continue to put in questions. I've already got a few. I'm going to turn to one of them. Now, we've um, uh, talked essentially about personal mobility options, although we had a bit of a tip of the hat uh, uh, to the wastefulness of driving in, in a car by yourself all the time from Robin. Um, the, um, uh, what about public transport? Uh, what, where does that fit in in our analysis of uh, the transportation future? What uh, I mean, I, I, as I say, I, I'm in New York City, where our, our system is best in America, but at the moment is under dire financial pressure because of the pandemic and infighting between, you know, New York State and New York City. I mean, all the classic problems, unfortunately, um, that we have, and maybe a lot of other transit systems have. Uh, does someone want to put something on the table about what you think could be different about public transit in America going forward? What, what are some interesting ideas or investments or opportunities that you see? I can speak a little bit specifically sure. to the, the scooter piece. So I, th I think a lot of the reasons that uh, public transportation um, isn't as widespread. I, I, Europe is is probably further along on this than the U.S. is, but uh, the U.S. is very widespread. So for a lot of people, um, particularly people in lower income communities, to get to a public transportation um, spot, it takes 20, 30 minutes of walking on their feet. Um, and a lot of people will then you know, choose a... Uh, a car or some other type of transportation. If we can, if we can kind of attack that last mile and turn that 30 minute walk into a five minute bike ride or a five minute scooter ride, I think it just 
um, allows us to take a lot of the more suburban people and and bring them to kind of the uh, allow them to use public transportation in uh, an easier fashion, I guess you could say. So that's that's, that's, that's a my really, pitch uh, on profound on point, uh, Casey. I, I I saw this in 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 real life in Asia where uh, the newer subway systems, uh, especially in Shanghai, for example, where I live in other big cities, uh, they're um, uh, they're really almost like urban light rail in the sense that the, the stations are much further apart than one would expect in San Francisco with the BART or in, or in New York, let's say, or in the Chicago system. And so people have to walk long distances to get home after they get off the subway. And, and that's also where, of course, the scooters took off first. Uh, the business model was pioneered and, and did spectacularly uh, well and had its ups and downs, but, but, but it met a genuine need for people uh, of uh, getting them home for what could often be more than the last mile, as you point out. Mm -hmm. um, any other complementarities or um, ideas I've, on I've public? Got, yeah, Sean, jump in. I've got one in the uh, kind of crazy idea bucket again. Is you know my dad was an iron worker on the on the L in Chicago, and you look at like oh my god, you know that infrastructure, how heavy, how costly these big cars. I mean, if you were to be able to remake something like that today with modern technology, it would be you know little pods, you know probably on a single rail that just carry, you know, one family, each one, each of these pods, uh, you know, there's simulations that you can see in some startups in the space, but, you know, Taxi 2000 was one of them that are, they're mostly thought pieces now, but, you know, you could imagine you kind of, your pod, you get in and then you hop on this bus and it's autonomous, right? Like it can keep distance from other cars. And as soon as you get to the stop you want, it kind of gets off the main rail and delivers you. So, you know, whenever I cross train tracks now, you kind of look both ways and there's like nothing, you know, no trains in either direction. So there's all this idle space, the through spares are there, but the vehicle types are just wrong right now for that infrastructure. I mean, imagine if there was some way, I don't, you know, I don't know if you could retrofit or whatever, but have sort of the uh, autonomous intelligence so that you have that one-to-one -one like experience on these already existing you know, through fares. I don't know what that would look like, but certainly for new builds, if you're building a new, uh, you know, piece of, of kind of public infrastructure, you could do it with that modern technology. And it would just be like a way better consumer experience. Um, very interesting idea, Sean. Uh, you know, John, if I could turn to you, uh, his idea sounds like a really slow version of Elon Musk's Hyperloop. Um, uh, and I know you know Elon, uh, obviously, with your experience at Tesla. Can you give us an idea of uh, what's the prospect? I know Chicago is looking at this some kind of rapid uh, uh, system to get from the airport to the city. And uh, how crazy is this? How, how uh, pie in the sky or hole in the ground is it for uh, when we could have ready, proven uh, alternatives that work, like the bus? Um, uh, which we just don't spend enough money to uh, get people to use or make convenient, uh, or uh, what uh, Latin America pioneered, the BRT or uh, the rapid bus, um, which is very similar in efficiency to subway systems uh, and has cost one-tenth the cost of building out a new subway line, and yet we don't really adopt it in America because we're Americans. Um, uh, any ideas on uh, the, you know, the, the hyper-looping of mobility? Yeah, it was... Um... Uh, at a conference a few years ago or at a hotel where there was a conference and it was a Google, uh, Google Leadership Conference and some of the folks couldn't get there, some of the keynotes couldn't get there because there was an accident on, uh, on, uh, on I-95 between Boston and New York. And, um, and people were lamenting, you know, having to take a cell on the train and things like that. Uh, and, uh, and Hyperloop was part of the conversation, et cetera. And, and it occurred to me that our infrastructure for high-speed dense transportation already exists. It's called the highway. Uh, and if you carve out a lane or two from these highway systems and put uh, higher density electric and autonomous vehicles, because you got a dedicated lane, you could Jersey, you could Jersey barrier for, uh, for gosh sakes. And you could, you could have cars that are driving uh, or vehicles that are driving, you know, multiple people, a little bit like your uh, Latin America example, 12 to 14 people. Uh, 150 to 175 miles an hour, uh, and you're reaching not uh, not maglev train, train speeds, but you're reaching Acela train speeds with no stops. And uh, those are very doable. We started to play with the chassis of a Model X, and uh, we could get a body that would take 14 people, and that thing will go 150 miles an hour. Uh, and uh, and I think 
leveraging infrastructure that's already there versus digging tunnels in the ground or it's 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 super inefficient uh to, uh, to both build and then maintain the vacuum within a hyperloop uh from an energy standpoint there's infrastructure that we can repurpose that i think could uh, could lead to really interesting breakthroughs i want to second john's john's uh, point there that is absolutely true and i think that's why the hyperloop was doomed to failure from the start is because the rights of way are so unbelievably costly and to build that infrastructure. So John's idea is on point. Um, there's another question from the floor um, and I know it'll immediately raise some chuckles and hackles, but hydrogen um, uh, once uh, hyped and overhyped perhaps, but is now back in vogue. But the, the questioner is quite careful in, in the question. What about green renewables based hydrogen in particular for industrial transport, uh, not necessarily for every uh, automobile. Uh, does anyone on the panel think there is uh, actually time to look again at hydrogen, despite the earlier hydrogen fuel cells bubble that didn't work out in personal transport? Um, who has some enthusiasm for looking at green hydrogen on this panel? Or do you all think it's it's not a it, viable it's option? Got a, it's got a limiter right now, and that is when you look at the, uh, when you look at what it takes to produce a, uh, a unit of energy of hydrogen, it just doesn't compete with the other uh, with the other alternatives, and that's why it hasn't. Uh, it really hasn't proliferated. Um, there's a safety. Are you talking about the, the inefficiency of the electrolysis process, presumably? Exactly. Exactly. For your assessment. Yeah. So if you look at uh, if you look at, a, at the equivalent of a kilowatt hour cost uh, across lithium, across hydrogen, it doesn't compete, uh, and that's why the world is 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 sort of moved in uh, in that direction. It it uh, for to your point, for longer haul trucking, it may be uh, more viable because there then is a trade-off between how long it takes to charge those lithium ion batteries uh, that will uh, power, say, the equivalent of a semi. Uh, you can, you can ref, uh, refuel a hydrogen vehicle much, much faster. Uptime really matters to the economics of that business. And so it may be viable there, but probably not in passenger um, uh, just due to the cost differential. Any a different thought on hydrogen from anyone? I want to plead lack of expertise. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, There's just so yeah, much say, momentum for batteries, right? Like, yeah. And, and yeah, you know, there, there I think is, um, solar, solar direct electricity production. I mean, I think solar is on this, you know, curve of, of better efficiency and lower cost. I mean, I feel like it's just going to be nearly impossible to catch. Uh, there is, uh, I mean, Japan kept up with its hydrogen investments. Germany uh, continues its investments in, and they have a great hydrogen infrastructure. Uh, Europeans who are more enthusiastic about this, uh, tell me who followed this and who are very environmentally minded. They're not in the back pocket of any particular uh, green, uh, in, uh, hydrogen lobby or anything. They say that there is a prospect, for example, in France, which has a dominant nuclear power grid in the middle of the night without enough load, they're giving the power away. And so if you're uh, converting practically free electricity that's made without carbon emissions from paid up infrastructure, that inefficiency of electrolysis may be less of a penalty, energy penalty or economic penalty. So there may be certain parts of the world where we may see hydrogen emerge. And again, if it's applied towards long haul trucking or something, which is uh, hard to decarbonize. And of course, aviation, we haven't even talked about that, uh, which is very hard to replace the energy density of jet fuel. Um, and so this could be an alternative for certain niche applications that could have a, uh, you know, uh, maybe even some industrial applications. So I just put that out there uh, as a marker for the future. But speaking about the future, we're, we're winding our way towards the end of our session. Um, uh, there is uh, one other direct question that I want to ask. We can have a quick answer from the audience, uh, from our panelists, I should say. It's an audience question. Um, is our electric grid, which has been called into question in Texas and California, of course, recently, uh, is it able to accommodate the demand for mass electric mobility, uh, especially EVs? Uh, and if not, what policies or innovations are necessary to allow this? I think our electric vehicle uh, gurus can maybe address this one. Uh, who wants to take it? John, do you wanna weigh in? Sure, sure. Uh, the, the short answer in the US is not yet, uh, it's not. Meaning it's not a problem yet, or the grid is not it's, it's, it, it will be a capacity problem. I think we're seeing those capacity uh, issues crop up. We have, in the U.S., different than other parts of the world, we have a very um, uh, subdivided grid uh, based on uh, geography and utility uh, spread. And in China, for instance, they have a unified grid. Um, and they've got a very uh, well thought out strategy about where you use high voltage lines, uh, where you place substations, 
where you do sourcing, where charging stations are for vehicles, all of that is in one cohesive strategy under one leader uh, uh, for the entire country. And, um, and they're- That's doing, very Chinese approach. A very Chinese approach. They're doing capacity planning for the electrification and we've got literally hundreds and sometimes thousands of different systems that have to come together to, uh, to make uh, both the generation and the distribution work. Uh, and as Churchill said, like the Americans uh, will fail, fail, fail before they finally get it right. I think this is one of the areas where we're going to have to have an electrification strategy, uh, infrastructure strategy that makes sense. The good news is policymakers are thinking about this. They recognize the problem, but it is an inherently uh, a difficult problem to solve uh, in the States versus uh, some other parts of the world. I mean, what we've spent uh, our time talking about local innovations, but I think uh, to me, the case is pretty clear. This is an area where we're too decentralized and too chaotic. We could actually use some rules of the road uh, right. and coordination from the, from the center on this. Um, Final question to my panel. I want a, a short answer from each of you, and then I'm going to turn it over to, to Hayes. Um, even a one word answer. Now, which year do you think we can confidently say that over half the trips taken by over half of Americans will involve a motor transport that is not the automobile? 2025, 2030, 2050, never. 2030. Let's 2030, Robin's putting her stake in the ground. Who's 2037. 2037, okay. Uh, John, if, what do you think? If, if the target is half of all trips, I, 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 want, I want it to be sooner than this, but it's probably 2050. Wait, it's half of all trips for half of Americans. For, for half of Americans. You're still I'm, sticking with 2050, okay. I, I'm gonna say today, and I'm counting a, a Zoom as a trip. <laughs> well done, Sarah, well played, nice. well played. Okay, well done. yes. You, you, win, you win the prize. Uh, so uh, let me uh, say thank you to each of my panelists. It's been fascinating. I've learned so much and I think we're really honored to have all of you with us. Uh, and I'm gonna turn it over to our host, Hayes. Thanks very much. Uh, and I really appreciate uh, as always, Vijay, uh, your wonderful hosting and moderation. Uh, and uh, so thank you. Uh, thanks to uh, all of the distinguished guests. This is really fun. I kept thinking, oh, I should go get a scooter. Yeah, but could I carry a, a gallon of milk? Lots of, lots of interesting <laughs> questions for all of us as we look toward the future, but also some, some uh, real encouraging uh, predictions that I'm excited about. Uh, thanks uh, also to our Dean, Julio Tino, for making this possible. And uh, for those of you in the audience for joining us today, thank you. You can follow us on social media if you want to find out what else Farley is hosting. Thanks, everybody. Take good care and happy travels, however they might be. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks, Sam.